Muy bien, vamos a presentar el panel de herramientas de concientización y difusión, preparándonos para una, 3, una vida 3.0. Algunos hablan de evolución y otros de revolución. Lo cierto es que la web que conocemos se encuentra próxima a cambiar. La información será capaz de relacionarse entre sí, clasificarse y ordenarse sin necesidad de una intervención humana. Los agentes inteligentes leerán información y devolverán conocimiento. Para su funcionamiento se requerirá del usuario mayor transparencia y apertura. Resulta crucial, entonces, analizar los nuevos desafíos que esta web presenta a la privacidad y a la protección de datos, así como conocer las iniciativas y estrategias que las autoridades y la sociedad civil pretenden desarrollar. Le proponemos un espacio de intercambio y discusión al respecto. Para moderar este segmento, convocamos a la señora Chantal Bernier, de Canadá, Chantal es licenciada en Derecho Civil por la Universidad de Sherbrooke y tiene una maestría en Derecho Público Internacional por la London School of Economics and Political Science. Junto a ella, los expositores Larry Majid, Connected Safely, Clara Guerra, Comisión Nacional de Protección de Datos de Portugal, Pablo Pérez San José, Inteco, y Steve Good, Jefe de Ejecución Política de ICO. Gracias a todos. Adelante usted. Merci, buenas tardes, eh, bonsoir, and uh, good evening to all of you. We have had quite a few discussions, all of us, on uh, how we wanted to present and design this panel. So what I'm going to do first, in French, I'm warning you, is uh, describe to you our approach, and then I will pass on the mic to our panelists. Ce qu'on a donc décidé de faire entre nous, c'est plutôt que d'avoir une série de présentations euh, distinctes, de diaporamas distincts, c'est d'avoir une conversation fluide. Nous n'avons qu'un seul euh, diaporama et je suis sur le point de vous le présenter. Et ce diaporama vous montre les questions que nous avons décidé euh, vraiment d'aborder en gros. Trois grandes questions. La première... Euh, pourquoi une boule de cristal Parce que le Web 3.0, c'est véritablement la lecture dans l'avenir. Qu'est-ce que ça nous réserve Et je vais donc demander d'abord à nos panélistes de me dire, de nous dire, qu'est-ce qu'ils voient dans cette boule de cristal Quels sont les développements à venir et donc les risques et les protections correspondantes Nous allons justement passer ensuite à la définition des risques et finalement aux protections afférentes. Alors, pour commencer cette discussion, je vais donc demander à Pablo de partager avec nous ce qu'il voit dans cette boule de cristal, et Steve va le suivre pour nous dire ce qu'il voit, lui, dans cette boule de cristal. Pablo. Hola, buenas tardes. <coughs> buenas tardes a todos. Eh... Es complicado eh, comenzar con una única definición de qué es eh, Web 3.0, ¿no? porque es una expresión que se utiliza para definir diferentes conceptos. ¿no? En primer lugar, para definir la evolución en el uso y la interactuación de las personas y la información en Internet. Por otro, en, en este caso, el paso de la Web 2.0, donde el protagonismo es de los usuarios, ¿no? la llamada web social, donde es el usuario, el que, los usuarios los que crean los contenidos, de ahí se pasa a esta web 3.0, donde los protagonistas van a ser los agentes inteligentes, es decir, las, llamémoslo así, máquinas que van a crear, gestionar e interrelacionar toda esa información que está en Internet creando algo nuevo. La web 3.0 también significa, eh, implica, mejor dicho, la transformación de la red en una gigantesca base de datos. Gracias a las posibilidades técnicas de la web semántica, gracias al desarrollo de la inteligencia artificial, se va a conseguir una plena categorización e interrelación entre los datos. Para explicarnos, ahora todo está en Internet, pero ese todo no es una realidad interrelacionada. 
esa, la web 3.0 va a implicar que ese conjunto disperso, caótico de información pueda ser relacionada entre sí por medio de la tecnología y converja de una mera suma de informaciones a, una, a un sistema, a una realidad. Web 3.0 también significa web semántica, esto es decir, a partir de etiquetas, de metadatos asociadas a la información, pues los programas informáticos, sin necesidad de intervención humana, podrán comprender el contenido, clasificarlo y relacionar unos datos con otros, creando, a partir de datos, creando conocimiento. Y, finalmente, dos aspectos importantes en la web 3.0 es que se refieren a la web geoespacial, entendida como que la información se identifica en un tiempo y en un lugar para así obtener búsquedas más precisas, más refinadas y ofrecer al usuario resultados más personalizados. Y, por otro lado, la llamada web 3D, es decir, aquello relacionado con los conceptos de realidad virtual, donde el usuario interactúa en Internet. Para resumir, ¿de dónde vamos y a dónde, de dónde estamos y a dónde vamos? ¿no? ¿Cuáles son las diferencias en la, entre la web 2.0 y la 3.0? En primer lugar, el origen de la información. Pasamos de la información creada por los usuarios a una información que va a ser, además de esa información creada por los usuarios, información recopilada a través de aplicaciones, información obtenida de bases de datos públicas y privadas, información incluso generada por los objetos. ¿no? Ya vemos cómo un frigorífico puede enviar, cuando falta leche, información para que ésta sea repuesta, te puede enviar un mensaje. Por otro lado, se pasa de una clasificación bibliotecaria a una auténtica interrelación, supercategorización de la información realizada por máquinas a través de estas eh, técnicas de inteligencia artificial. De un uso basado en la consulta de contenidos de otros usuarios a una consulta de información creada ad hoc, en ese instante, de forma instantánea, donde los datos son una materia prima y de lo que se obtiene, esa información se tiene un producto de un control de información realizado por los usuarios y un acceso a la información con las restricciones definidas por los usuarios a un escenario en el cual, a priori, no va a haber control y eh, un acceso general. Y, finalmente, pasamos de los dispositivos de acceso a esa información convencionales, los ordenadores, los teléfonos, los smartphones, las tablets, a una, un escenario donde haya... Eh, diferentes eh, eh, dispositivos de acceso, electrodomésticos, herramientas, eh, dispositivos informáticos, un coche, el llamado Internet de los objetos y pasamos de una herramienta como el navegador a herramientas específicas, multiplataformas, multidispositivos, eh, donde va a ser muy importante la interoperabilidad. Gracias, Pablo. Entonces, un desafío de control siempre más complejo. Steve, what do you see uh, then as the future of 3.0? Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll add to some of those um, really useful points that, um, that, that Pam. Sorry, <laughs> I'll, I'll start with a mic on again. Um, I'd like to um, add to some of those really useful points that um, Pablo's already made. And in, in researching and, and thinking about the background for Web 3.0 um, for, the, for the session today, I, I think it's very clear that the There are a number of different views of Web 3.0, and even the, the guy, Tim O'Reilly, who many of you know coined the term Web 2.0, is not necessarily too keen on necessarily trying to characterize um, Web 3.0. But I think the, the main thing is, but I think everybody can agree, that the Web is still evolving, and that is a really an, an important point to acknowledge. And we may be reaching a tipping point where we can actually see new characteristics in, in, in the way the, uh, that the Web is actually evolving. And I think if we, if, if we think across um, from, the, from, the, from the birth of the, the World Wide Web, from Web 1.0, which was really about basic information stores, thinking about Web 2.0, which was about introducing concepts around blogs and, 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 and social media and, and, and concepts such as um, RSS and, 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 and interactions on, on the web. I think we can actually trace the sort of the centrality of, of, of these, um, th these new applications on the web to people's lives. Probably Web 1.0, we, we, we many people saw the web as, as, as useful, 
but probably not not really central to their to, to, to their lives. It was a useful place to be able to go up and look up some information. Encyclopedia uh, Britannica was was online for the first time. You, you could you could find more information. Web 2.0. You're able to start to interact with other people, you're able to shop online, you're able to do a lot more, and I think the web was becoming more important to people. I think when you think about web, if you can think about web 3.0, it's about the centrality of certain concepts, and it's about really the centrality of the web to people's lives, and it's about the way that a digital footprint can really can link in the way that um, Pablo was talking about in terms of data from different devices being able to be easily linkable, to be able to actually create um, easily um, a, a whole view of an individual's activities on, on the web. So I certainly think that the concept of personalization is a, is, is a very important um, consideration if, if, if we wish to uh, characterize Web, web 3.0. And the concept of, of big data and, and open data are, are, are crucial components of, of, of Web 3.0. And the idea of uh, increasing links and the intelligence of those links between the databases are being the crucial part, and that's where the, the semantic web aspect comes in. So. I would also just like to um, also highlight the, the perspective that we have on the issue as the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK, that we're um, responsible for regulating both the Data Protection Act, so that's the privacy legislation in the UK, and also the Freedom of Information Act. So we're also um, the regulator for, for open, openness and, and transparency, and certainly we're seeing concepts related to Web 3.0 also being applied to the Freedom of Information Act in the UK. Our, our legislation under Freedom of Information is currently being upgraded to add concepts relating to open data, so that's reusable formats for public sector information and open licensing. So I think legislation is also driving uh, Web 3.0 from, from, from different areas. So. The, the, the emerging concepts, the, the, the crucial issues, I think, are the, the linkability and the, and the personalization of information and the, cent the centrality of that. And also, I think, the centrality of that to business models. And that's perhaps where we may, say, may see there actually being a, a tipping point and why we should actually perhaps start to take notice or, 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 or talk in these terms. And I also think it's the way that the barriers to entry in the Web 3.0 uh, world are very low in terms of how different entrants can come into the marketplace as, as app developers, one guy in a bedroom, et cetera, how they can actually enter the marketplace is an important characteristic. Thank you, Steve. So clearly, great potential. But every time you look at the future, there's always someone who will come up with the doom and gloom. And today, uh, it's going to be Clara. So I'm going to ask Clara then to share with us what risks do you see on Life 3.0? Thank you, Chantal. Um, to this question, if, if you are ready for Life 3.0, I would say that we as authorities are still digesting life <laughs> 2.0. <laughs> so we'll have a lot of problems with life 3.0. Uh, but uh, I think it's, it's just around the corner. The, the life uh, 3.0 has a very facilitated life as all the information is already there. On one side, the offline world has become to the online world world with no control of, uh, of, from the data subjects of their own data. And on the other side, we have this explosion of social networks where people voluntarily upload the information, their likes, their dislikes, their options, their ideas, their behavior. So it's the entire lives, all information about themselves. Of course, if we are talking about the potentialities uh, as our uh, Pablo and, uh, and Steve already uh, pointed out, the potentialities of these intelligent systems, intelligent machines that will work on this information in a much uh, quick way, cross-reference, um, uh, labeled work this information, allegedly to meet our own deepest uh, wishes. Uh, of course, the data subject is in the center of the world, but we already have provided information. So uh, the idea is to get us the best answer. And if I ask for something, 
I'll get the best answer. If I, I, I wish something, the best scenario will be provided. And even if I don't ask anything, I'll get the answer, the offer, the best offer I've never dreamt anyway. So um, this is Web 3.0, I think, intends to know you better than yourself. And we should uh, be alerted that these intelligent systems with no this um, interconnection, interlinking of information, personal information, and I would stick to the personal information, um, these this, this intelligent systems, uh, well, uh, I would like to, to stress that uh, every system, whether intelligent or not, it's human programmed. So this means it's human criteria that how we program things. There's a human criteria, therefore there's a subjective criteria. And um, I think this uh, here, uh, like Steve pointed out, the key word is personalization. And this personalization means profiling. Profiling by itself, it's not a new reality where we already have profiling. We have profiling, but now we are talking about an upper level of profiling, refined profiling, with more uh, IT support, with larger potential. Uh, and so the risks we'll be facing will be the same, more or less the same, but in a much larger scale. And in that sense, there will be bigger ones. And um, because profiling, even nowadays, uh, that's why I said that we are still digesting how to deal with, uh, with life uh, 2.0. Profiling is hardly transparent. Uh, is always subject, subject, uh, subjective. It intends to label people, to categorize people, to classify people. And this is something uh, that raises a lot of questions because uh, all of this happens without the people's control, without the data subject's control. And uh, I, I, I think there are uh, some danger that uh, with all these intelligent systems based on uh, profiling us on the information we provided, but it's, like I said, always a subjective profiling, that you even get uh, less choices. Um, I'm afraid that self-determination uh, may be in danger because uh, if things are already filtered before it gets to you, if they are predetermined, your decisions might be conditioned. Um, so I think that uh, um, we really uh, have uh, uh, some risks, uh, strong, uh, big risks in front of us. And of course, this criteria for the profiling, uh, the goals that this uh, first criteria that makes the, the information uh, goes on, uh, the goals are specific goals, economic goals, uh, not exactly an individual goal, not coincident with our own individual goals. In fact, nobody is really interested uh, to care whether you like the beach or the countryside. That information might only be useful if they want to sell you a holiday package. And that, they want to know if you like the beach and if you like with pebbles or with sand or if you like with palm trees or if you like camping or, or, or going to a hotel. And then, even if you like to go to a five-star hotel, if there is information that you cannot afford a five-star hotel, you'll get an offer of three-star hotel according to, to your um, financial uh, <laughs> situation. So uh, I think that um, the risks are uh, indeed high and uh, we may be facing some problems that goes uh, beyond uh, data protection. It, it may enter into our freedom, our freedom of choices. And uh, uh, that's something that uh, surely concerns me. And uh, just to, to end this first round, I think that um, someone pointed out today in the plenary session, the first plenary session, uh, the, the role of the states and the role uh, what we want for us, for the world. And I, I would like, I think that all these questions 
can be resumed in one question that it, it was uh, put by the President of Uruguay uh, last year in the Rio summit, ECO summit, and I would like to quote him in Spanish because I think this is a question that we, we really have to, to answer, and depending on the answer, we'll have uh, different uh, perspectives, I'm sure. So, the President of the Uruguay, uh, José Pepe Mujica, uh, made this very interesting question. ¿Estamos gobernando la globalización o es la globalización que nos gobierna nosotros? So, I think this is what we, we, should, we should think about, and depending on our reflection, uh, I'm sure we'll find a way to, to, to solve this. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Um, I think um, I'm going to use this quote from now on, which I feel summarizes so well what Pablo and Steve said, is uh, the word you say that 3.0 is the web knowing you better than you know yourself. So, Larry, you've heard this, uh, what is 3.0, what are the risks, how do you bring it all together? Well, I want to... Um refer you to three initials that you already know. Everybody here knows WWW, right? That stands for World Wide Web. Well, I want to welcome you to WNW. That stands for Wonderful New World. It's a world that we are actually already in and getting deeper into over the next several years. The cloud, the ubiquitous cloud, although the cloud above us today is probably moving very fast uh, through the winds, but it's nevertheless one very, very large globally connected cloud. It knows what you want. It knows who you are. It knows what websites you want to visit. It knows what magazines and newspapers or online websites you want to read. It knows what movies you like, what books you like. It knows so much about you that your email can probably answer itself. Your driverless car knows exactly where you want to go. And by the way, as you're going there, it knows everything around you. It knows every store you pass, every tree you go by, every pedestrian who happens to be near your car as you uh, commute to work or wherever it is you want to go. Your mobile device, and this is already here, can find new friends for you. And while it's found that friends, it can find out what you have in common. And rather than you having to pick the movie or the book that you might want to watch or read together, it could pick it for you, and for that matter, it knows what you like to eat and what your friend likes to eat, your new friend who you don't even know yet, and so it can pick a restaurant that you're both going to be delighted by. It can arrange common activities. You know, the web is great for the spider, but it's not so good for the fly. And so we have to look at this wonderful new world or this giant, giant cloud-like web and figure out how it's benefiting us and how it's harming us. And there's no question in my mind that there are benefits to big data and cloud storage and having machines that know more about us than we know about ourselves. I thought about it this afternoon when I needed to make a, uh, a, a reservation on the ferry between here and Buenos Aires. It was a ridiculously difficult process even though I was using a website. The cloud knows where I am. The cloud knows exactly where I'm going. It knows I've got a plane reservation back to San Francisco on Saturday. It ought to darn well know how to get from here to the airport. Yet, it doesn't quite know enough. And I was thinking, gee, it would have been nice if instead of having to go through all this effort, it could have said, Larry, you can fly for $267, or you can take a ferry for uh, $89. Which one do you want? And I would have said the ferry, and I would have been done. So in some ways, I'm actually looking forward to that wonderful new world. I want the tools that are going to make my life easier. I actually don't mind the idea that I might be able to meet a new friend and be able to quickly decide what movie to watch together or what restaurant to eat, uh, to eat in together. But I also worry, and this is picking up on, on what my, my friends on the panel have been saying, because there is a possibility of abuse. There is the possibility of something going wrong. That driverless car, instead of taking me to work, could take me to the wrong location or perhaps take me to where somewhere else, someone else wants me to go, even though I don't want to go there. Because after all, I'm no longer in the driver's seat. Software running in the cloud, running on a computer that I didn't program is driving that car. There's something to be said for turning the steering wheel to the left and not moving to the right. 
And I have to tell you, after looking at some of the politicians around here, I'm not sure we can say that about our governments. There's something about the lack of serendipity that scares me when it, talks, when it comes to information. Right now, I kind of like the fact that I can go from uh, a right-wing publication one moment to a left-wing publication a minute later, uh, to a publication five minutes later, and then read some uh, sports, and then read some business, and then read some fiction. I worry about the lack of serendipity, the lack of control, when suddenly that wonderful new world is sort of pacing me through my reading materials based on what it knows, not thinks, but knows, that I need to look at. So that lack of choice, that lack of serendipity is certainly uh, frightening. I definitely worry about the big brothers. And there are two big brothers that I worry about, and I suppose I should not be sexist. I guess they could be big sisters as well. Uh, especially now that we have women running many countries and many corporations, or at least a few countries and corporations. I worry about the state, because all of this can be abused by people running states. And we can look around the world today and see states where clearly uh, the people in control would and could and will abuse whatever data they have access to and do. And even looking at my own country, the United States of America, which we pride ourselves on being so democratic, it doesn't take much of a history lesson to remember despots that were working in our country in my lifetime who were incredibly uh, dictatorial and, and authoritarian in the way they used information. We had a Federal Bureau of Investigation run by a man named J. Edgar Hoover, who, boy, if he were only alive today, how happy he would be with the tools that he would have at his disposal to know everything about everybody. And he did it back then uh, using typewriters and, uh, and telephones. Imagine what he would do today. And believe me, there are more J. Edgar Hoovers in the world uh, that are still alive and coming up. So we have to worry about that. But you know, I worry, as much as I worry about the state, I also worry about the multinational corporations. I'm not against corporations. I'm not against capitalists. I run an NGO that gets money from some of the very giant corporations whose representatives may be in this room right now. But that doesn't mean I don't worry about them. Multinational corporations who know no allegiance to any state, whose board of directors is not elected by the people but by the stockholders, are increasingly the guardians and the, the holders of massive amounts of information about every one of us. And in fact, I'm beginning to think that some of these multinational corporations have more data and more power than many of the states. Facebook, which I like, has more members than any country in the world except China and India has citizens. That's a frightful thought, to think that the amount of information that Facebook has about people may actually exceed the amount of information that our FBI and KGB, or whatever they call it now in Russia, and all of the other intelligence agencies in the world have on the people that they are, are spying on. Google, massive amounts of information. Apple, increasingly, massive amounts of information. Microsoft, massive amounts of information. And I know there are people in this room from all of those companies, and I'm not saying that you're evil any more than I'm saying that uh, the government of the United States or of Uruguay or anywhere else is evil. But there is always the potential at some point, Mark Zuckerberg is going to grow up and retire, and I don't know who's going to replace him. At some point, Larry Page of Google is going to step down, and I don't know who's going to replace him. So just as I don't know, and I don't know who's going to replace the leaders of any one of our countries. So there is ample reason to be concerned about the downside of the wonderful new world. But before we condemn it, we also have to remember that there's plenty of reason to be excited about the potential as well. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we needed a positive, uh, positive note here because uh, this is getting like way too gloomy. So I think we need to move know, then well, to the problem. third question. Uh, well, okay, so how do we protect ourselves against new risks and how, as the title of this workshop says, how do civil society regulators raise awareness and provide tools for protection in front of new risks? So I'm going to turn this question first to the two representatives from regulators. So I'm going to ask Clara first to address the issue of protection and then Steve. Thank you, Chantal. With all this description, I'm sure our work is not going to be easy, I'm sure. <laughs> 
but um, uh, I think that uh, we all and uh, data protection authorities or data protection community in particular, we need to rethink a little bit. Um, not to rethink the principles because the principles are correct and in the periods of crisis, fundamental rights are the most important things we have. It's exactly in this kind of period that that's why fundamental rights exist. It's not, it's for these times especially. So it's not to rethink the principles, but it's to rethink the practical implementation of the principles. The models we are used to, um, it seems they are not so adequate anymore. And the proof is that we are already talking about the Web 3.0 and we are not able to solve the problems of Web 2.0. So this means we, we, have, we have a great delay to uh, stick to defend people's rights. And the most dramatic thing is that we are aware that there are huge problems and we, we've never, we, we, we have not been able to uh, find um, a good solution or uh, the best way. I don't have the solution in my pocket either, <laughs> anyway. But uh, I, I would like to uh, suggest um, a possible way forward. And uh, I would like to present a twofold perspective. On the one uh, hand, uh, regulation, and on the other hand, prevention. So, firstly, the regulation. Regulation, we, we all heard that, well, we need regulation, but we don't need over-regulation. We need regulation with self-regulation and co-regulation. So, <laughs> uh, this is very debatable, but uh, I think regulation, uh, in fact, we need better regulation, we need wider regulation. We are in an international conference. Of course, we have differences, we have cultural differences, but we have the same concerns. So we need to get a common ground. There's no point, being the web so global, there's no point in having regulation only in some parts of the world. Uh, it's been uh, quite uh, enthusiastic to see that in the recent years, America, Central, South America, the United States also, with very promising uh, initiatives, Asia, Africa. The data protection has entered, has scattered, has developed in all these regions. So it's becoming more worldwide and that, that's what, what we need. We need a regulation that covers uh, not the entire, entire world, but at least where, where things uh, tick. And um, this regulation has to be inseparable of two other um, tools, we may say. Uh, one hand, international cooperation. We really have to reinforce international cooperation. And why not use this all, we are in the communication age, why not use the fast tools? We can't take months or, e or years to cooperate among two DPAs or among two organizations to solve a person's rights. We need to find out faster solutions, easy solutions, and really to reinforce this cooperation in order to provide a greater protection to citizens. And the other inseparable tool would be enforcement. We need to have enforcement powers and we need to use them, not to be afraid to use the enforcement powers. To defend citizens' rights, it's not a negotiation. The law, and if we have good regulations, and if and when they are bad regulations, they are to be complied with. So, if we have, um, there are a lot of things which are not regulated. Regulation always has this drawback of being late. You, you have to regulate in a neutral way because technology is dynamic and changing every day. But you, you can't be so, so generic that you, 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 you don't tackle the problems, the, the practical problems. So we need to find a good way to do this. On the other side, the prevention. Um, well, we, we all, I suppose we all um, uh, agree that um, data subjects are key players in, in this game. 
it's the, it's their data, it's the personal data that feed the web and feed all these uh, interconnections, interlinkings, and so on. So, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I'll finish in a while. So uh, I think that we, we, we need to provide citizens with instruments in order to make them the possibility of, of really making choices. So we need to, um, to raise awareness, to create um, uh, awareness tools, campaigns, targeting things. We don't want to, to bore them with data protection lessons, but we need to be practical and use very uh, practical examples to, to reach people. And it, among all these people, um, children has a, 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 central, a central role, not only because they are a vulnerable group, but because this is an investment in the future. Children will be the uh, future citizens, they already are citizens, but the future active citizens and, and adults. And it's indispensable that they know the risks, they know the potentiality of the technology so they can use it in their benefit and uh, they can use it in the correct way with control of, the, of their data. So in order to have the people, the persons to, to have a word to say about their data and what to do with that, we need to give them things. And where, where should, should children learn? In my opinion, the basic and natural environment would be the school. We need to get data protection and privacy to school, as natural as learning how to add two and plus two. So this has to be a natural thing. They, they use technology, they learn technology, they learn what, what is a browser, uh, how, how to make, uh, to, to use access and uh, a search engine and so on. So they also would, would need to know the risks and how to use it, the potentialities, what's behind, what, what's behind the unsaid. In order not to, in order to, to be able to have a choice. If they want to risk, it's their choice. We don't have to be patronized. I just, just, just to finalize, to give you a great news for, I suppose for everybody, but for data protection community and for everybody, to share with you in first hand uh, this great new. In Portugal, we started a, ch a project for children <coughs> five years ago, uh, addressed to schools. The idea was to stimulate the Ministry of Education to introduce um, data protection in curricula. This was a voluntary project, <coughs> so the children, the, the teachers who wanted to adopt it, they, they would, the others didn't. <coughs> Sorry. So, at this point, this year, we managed to convince the Ministry of Education under a revision, curricular revision, to formally introduce in the ICT discipline in the 12 and 13 years old, it's two years they have that discipline, ICT, Information and Communication Technologies, to introduce data protection and privacy, mandatory for all people. So we are happy because now this is formally a part of the curricula. And then we'll talk about it later. Thank you. Thank you. So there's hope. Uh, so hearing from the other regulator on the panel, Steve, what do you see as protection? Thank, thank you very much. Um, I think that, that, that there's lots I, I, I can echo and, and, and support in, in what, what, what Clara said there. Um, and I, I certainly think it's vital about getting the, the right mix of the, um, of the regulatory um, s solutions in place. That's at, at, at national and, and, and international level. And I also think it's important that we, um, we, we think about, as Clara says, that many of the key principles still work, but we do have to rethink some of the solutions. And I think the point that Clara mentioned about the fast pace and the, the, the changing nature, really, but as regulators, we've got to be increasingly agile to be able to quickly respond to these new issues as they emerge in terms of how quickly we can get guidance out, how quickly we can go in, out to meet new stakeholders, new, new players in the market as they, as, as they start to emerge. And, uh, 
the, the, the ICO in the, in the UK, we, we would very much think about a, a, a model based on, on, on three E's in terms of the first E obviously being enforcement, and as Clara said, that's always got to be an, an important component as, as, of, as to what we do as a, as a data protection regulator, but also the importance of education. So that's educating organizations and providing guidance to them, codes of practice, setting out key principles, and also um, education in terms of education to, to data subjects, which I'm going to mention the ICO's own project um, about that um, in, in, in a minute. But also I think it's important as a regulator, we really enable and support and encourage people out there in the marketplace to start to think about privacy-friendly solutions to some of these problems. We really need to encourage the concept of, of privacy science in order to try to get people to come forward with the, with the right solutions. And I think one of the hardest challenges we've often discussed at these conf conferences is still the issue about how we actually get privacy by design really taken seriously, how the business case is made for privacy by design, and that still remains um, a key challenge for, for Web 3.0. In terms of the, um, the self-regulatory model, I think it is important that we do think about privacy seals and trust marks in terms of helping inform the, the consumer or the, the data subject on their journey in terms of the privacy choices they make. I don't think it's the entire solution. I think we know there have been many problems and issues with um, privacy seals and trust mark schemes. That's where you would have a, a, a symbol or a, a logo on the website where a, um, a, a company or an organization has had the privacy policy verified or checked, perhaps by a third party who is, who is authorized by a data protection regulator. But there has to be merit in, in revisiting the the privacy seal concept to sit alongside the difficult issue of people being able to make choices from reading 28 page long privacy notices. So although we have to still work hard on getting privacy notices better, I think it is worth re-exploring the concept of privacy seals and trust marks. However, we know that there are some difficulties in doing that. And I think at least once we can get a benchmark out there on a workable privacy seal module, um, then we can actually start to actually push the bar higher in terms of the standards we could actually push for in, in privacy seals. The other area I'd like to, 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 to mention in terms of a sort of an emerging privacy risk and an emerging issue is, is the problem of effective anonymization. So which is a, a particular an issue we're coming across at the UK um, Commissioner's Office in terms of particularly public sector bodies disclosing data sets and whether these data sets are effectively anonymized when they're made available as, as, as open data. And we're very much seeing sometimes the risks of anonymizations are being, uh, anonymization is being understated and sometimes it seems to be an overstated. And we're really trying to in encourage um, a better framework and a better understanding to, to, to guide organizations to make the right decisions about anonymization in terms of getting them through the process of getting the right experts involved. And that may be people who have a particular statistical background who need to work alongside the privacy officer to get the right decision-making process in place about anonymization and clearly when we're talking about more linked data and pieces of the jigsaw coming together then the risks of anonymization um, must be acknowledged so that's a piece of work we're doing at the UK um, Commissioner's Office at the moment where we have um, a code of practice on anonymization which is, is, is coming out in November um, First, lastly, I, I want to, um, to, to echo a point Clara made about education, and it's, it's, it's really um, brilliant to hear that, that they've had that breakthrough in, in Portugal and actually convincing the education minister to be able to get that embedding in the curriculum, and we're very much looking at a similar project here in the UK. How do we actually really focus on the younger generation? I think we've had um, some attempts to do that in the past as a regulator in terms of having some materials and information based on our own website, but it's clear that's not enough. We've got to get in there at the source and actually have these issues actually embedded in the information curriculum. So it's vital to work with educators in this area to actually get these key messages across and to get quite a sophisticated understanding of some of the issues amongst children at the, at the right stage of their development and, and, and learning about issues. And I think we're seeing some teachers in school um, addressing the issues, but it's still perhaps more around the being safe online agenda, which is important and it's obviously a 
a key component of that education curriculum, but there's more probably that can be done in that area to expand beyond that concept about getting people to understand the nature of their interactions online, what it means about them, to actually explore that in, in more detail. So I would echo, echo the, the, the other piece of the jigsaw being a long-term education project and what regulators can do to stimulate that and, and work with others really, because I think the key thing in this always has to be it's a partnership of many to really make it work. Thank you, Steve. So we've heard from the two regulators. We have 20 minutes left, and we were really, really hoping to have time to hear from you. So I'm now going to ask Pablo and Larry uh, to address the issue of protection. So first, Pablo. Gracias. La privacidad. Well, privacy is a right that has uh, cost a lot of effort and uh, time. However, digital natives, they can understand it as something inherited, and perhaps they don't uh, know how to value it rightly. The internet is full of traps for privacy, camouflage in a very attractive ways uh, with online services to capture uh, data and also certain applications look like it's worthwhile to sacrifice that uh, privacy and that uh, privacy lesions don't have uh, tangible or visible consequences for you. So, so little by little we assume that our data are worth nothing. And that's not the case. I have many examples to show you and share with you how um, um, that uh, information is uh, being used uh, in a uh, monetary way. So those of us working in data protection and uh, information security, we have to promote a safe environment. And uh, I'm going to suggest uh, some actions that uh, may be carried out. On the other hand, and uh, I think this is the purpose of this panel, we have to raise awareness among citizens of the um, control use of the internet, why it's important, why we have to protect ourselves, and why we have to respect uh, um, the privacy of the other people, and what is there behind those very attractive and free of charge uh, services. We're talking about Web 3.0, and what is there behind? What are the business models behind those internet models, which uh, are focused on uh, capturing those uh, data and the actions that uh, public powers may carry out uh, towards uh, a safe environment and reliable environment. On the one hand, we have to um, uh, require a very proactive attitude from industry and promote self-determination with ethical codes. On the other hand, we have to demand from industry uh, the information and transparency about the services and their possibilities and to uh, demand a certain usability so that when ve with very use easy tools, uh, users can uh, control and configure their privacy. Something important about 3.0 is the integrity of information. Whenever we have that much information, uh, when it's when it comes down to us, it should be complete. So to uh, look after unbiased information, updated information, to do away with faked data, uh, this uh, question of the uh, right to be forgotten, this trace that we leave in the internet, it is something that uh, the authorities must require uh, from the industry and that we must try to inform citizens about these issues to ask for better and improved systems of labeling of contents. That's going to be very important for the semantic web, but also for the control to have access to inappropriate access or even illicit by minors. To disseminate and establish uh, claim channels, rapid intervention channels to delete certain information, uh, particularly information related to the right to cancel certain dates that are going to be so important in this new uh, Web 3.0 environment where information that is interlinked is so important. And lastly, something that is very important and uh, perhaps making a mea culpa since we 
uh, here gathered, uh, gathering people from so many countries, perhaps to harmonize uh, the rules uh, in many countries. Uh, it is true that the industry um, complains that sometimes the rules uh, to be complied with are different uh, from one country to the other, and that's chaotic, and even with an ethical commitment to develop those commitments and uh, implement them, uh, to develop specific rules since we are getting to different scenarios to promote good practices, to promote self-regulation, and to revisit the way some institutions and principles uh, work. I would like to um, continue, but I have to stop here. Um, in relation to Web point, uh, 3.0, we know that there are official bulletins uh, because of the question of open data, um, giving a lot of information to the web. And perhaps we should uh, think about whether that dilemma between so much transparency in the web and other the rights that because of the permanence of uh, uh, information and the facility of having access to the uh, information may be prejudiced. So I go back to this question of the right to uh, be forgotten. I go back to the question of raising awareness among citizens. I could give examples of what we do in Spain, but I'm sure they're going to be very similar to what Clara has said and what my colleagues may say later on. Thank you. With every panel member, you can see this. And uh, uh, unlike the others on the panel, I am not a government employee or a regulator, but I did have the honor of serving on the Obama administration's online safety technical working group, where we looked at online safety. And uh, as the author of the Education Committee report to the United States Congress, what I and my colleagues concluded is that yes, regulation has a role, and yes, industry best practices has a role, but at the end of the day, education has the biggest role. That what we need is an empowered citizen three. A citizen three, a citizens who have knowledge, who have skills, and who have the attitude that they have the right to take control of their own information and their own safety and their own activities as they circumvent this wonderful new world. And so whether it's children in school or adults in the marketplace, having those educational tools, having that knowledge, having that awareness is ultimately what will protect people. It's great to have governments thinking about how to protect people. It's very important to have companies using their industry best practices to do the right thing. But at the end of the day, you have to have an aware user base and you have to have aware citizens. You know, we talk a lot about digital citizens in the field that I am, and by the way, I'm co-director of connectsafely.org, which is an NGO that, that works in the area of internet safety, and we work mainly with children. Uh, but at the end of the day, when we talk about digital citizenship, we're not just talking about how people behave. You know, children shouldn't bully, children should be kind, children should do the right thing. We're also talking about the rights of children. It's responsibilities and rights. And we have a right to privacy. We have a right to self-expression. We have a right to regulations that protect us, but we also have a right to be protected from regulations whose unintended consequences actually suppress us. So for example, in the United States, we have a very well-intentioned law called the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And even though most of you are not United States citizens, it affects everyone in this room, or certainly all of our children, because almost every single social networking site and interactive service that serves young people does not allow children under 13, regardless of what country, uh, to express themselves and to share information because America's Children's Online Privacy Protection Act has very strict regulations about access to information from children. That is a very good idea a very well-intentioned law. But it also means that children, if they obey the rules and don't lie about their age, although millions do lie about their age, that children do not have access to some of the information services that they might want to use to exercise their freedom of expression and to exercise their right to information. So we have two conflicting pieces of regulations. We have the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which was signed into law only by the United States, but affects the entire world. And we have the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was signed by every country in the world except the United States, and by the way, Somalia for some reason, which actually requires that children have the right of self-expression 
and the right to full access of information. Yet, in the United States, it is against the law for children to have access to some uh, tools of expression and information. And that law, although it doesn't necessarily apply in every country, affects every country. So here we have a very well-meaning law which actually has the effect of countering some very, very cherished traditions globally and especially in the United States around freedom of information. We have a First Amendment. Many of you have similar laws. There is nothing in our First Amendment that says it applies to people 18 years or older or 13 years or older. It applies to all the people from birth through, through their lifespan. Yet we have laws that control children's access to information. Again, very well-meaning laws. So when we talk about protection of children, Clara, you made a very good point. Children are our current citizens and our future leaders. We need to protect them, but we also, don't, we also need not to suppress them. The same is true with adults. We do not want what we call in America a nanny state to tell us what we can do and what we can't do. I don't want anyone telling me that I don't have the right to share on Facebook what I had for breakfast or who I want to go out with or where I want to travel. I have the right to do that. But I also have the right to control that information. I have the right to limit that information. I have the right to decide who I want to share it with and who I don't want to share it with. And I have the right to delete it when I want to delete it. And so when we look at regulation, we need to think in a broader context. The right to be forgotten. As a journalist, I, in addition to running an NGO, I'm also a journalist, I'm not so sure I want to be told that I have to forget about certain historical facts just because they might uh, embarrass somebody who did something a number of years ago that they might want forgotten if it is part of the public record. So again, we really need to think of the unintended consequences of well-meaning regulation. I am very optimistic. I look around this panel and I see some incredibly thoughtful, intelligent, and, and humanistic uh, people who I know are looking out for the best interest of their own country people and, uh, and not wanting to be harmful to the people from the rest of the world. I actually am optimistic that we will come to some kind of a, uh, of a realization over a period of time and we will work this out. But we are in a very difficult position right now. We are in a transitional stage. Most of us are kind of making things up as we go along. And uh, as we do this, I think we need to constantly remind ourselves that there are well-meaning intentions, but unintended consequences, and we need to figure out a proper balance so that we move forward with privacy and protection, but we also don't stifle innovation, and most important, we don't stifle people's right to expression and information. Merci, Larry. Uh, Thank you, Larry. Due to our delay, we have very little time to get questions, and I think that we could have five minutes to uh, have your questions and your comments. If you would like to ask questions, you can ask them in English, French, or Spanish. Yes, I think that we will need a microphone. Are there? Yes, there's. A microphone back there. Um, my name is Alison from South Africa. The, the question that I really want to ask is: I'm not. It, once people have made information public, they may regret it at a later stage. But that information is then public. When you have the ability to put various data sets together and create from a range of, uh, of information that I've deliberately made, I mean, I've, I've knowingly deliberately made public, I put that together and then in some way discover something about you that is private. Is that something that the law can control or that regulators can actually deal with? Or is that just an unfortunate consequence of the way the web works now and the, and the way information works. You're directing your question to someone in particular or any of the panelists. Yeah. So who wants to go for that? Or actually protect privacy? Here's a the lawyer. Is it even if the answer is yes, it's only yes for a very short period of time because it's going to constantly change because what you're describing is the current state of technology 
And that kind of technology is going to evolve in such a way that the law that's written in 2012 will probably not be very good at anticipating the technological possibilities of 2020. And that, that's just, you know, that's my long-term answer to, to the question, but there may be better answers. Well, uh, if I understood your question, um, the law has some um, some possibilities to, to, to deal with it, but uh, it depends. Uh, in some way, uh, the information made public um, can be used. Uh, in some places, they cannot be used as, um, as a new data processing with a different purpose. Or this means that you, you, you may have a word to say, you may, you may ask for deletion, uh, but uh, like Larry said, it's a tricky thing. Pre mainly because on the web, even on the web, you, ca you, you can delete in one site, for instance, but it has already been replicated in other sites, and it'll keep coming up. And you, you get out of your jurisdiction very quickly. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> It's, it's in another country, it's another place, it's, it's posted elsewhere, so it's very hard to deal with it. That's, that's a very interesting video uh, done in uh, Hong Kong, I think, um, about two teenagers uh, posting information on the web. And all, the, all the, the, the message was on the button enter, because from the point you press that button, it's it's the end of it. Uh, in fact, we can talk about all the uh, legal mechanisms that are in place to minimize things, but in fact, once you press the, the enter button, it's, 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 the end, uh, it's the end of your privacy to that information, in fact. One more question. Is there another question? Oui, monsieur. Can we bring a microphone to this gentleman over there? Thank you. My name is Peter Michael. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, not of this panel, but earlier today, we saw that each child in Uruguay get a computer. And they communicate with the computer, and they're all linked free of charge with Internet. If I combine that with two words I heard in this panel, namely control and lack of choice, that gives a frightening picture. Uh, the umbrella you showed might be the, the control or the protection provided for by I don't know whom, but it also may mean that you can only be under the umbrella because everything outside of the umbrella, you won't go because we control you where you want to go, what you want to do. So Clara Guerra said something about the principle should be there, but we should, should perhaps rethink about it. Uh, we, we might want to have new principles. Uh, we're already we're talking about the right to be forgotten. But there might be a principle like uh, the right not to participate, meaning I am allowed to be on, on the highway, but no one is allowed to do anything with my data unless I, pr in, uh, prior to that, give my agreement. That's control. So you then have to end the control, uh, and you have a choice. So from the, the, the frightened picture towards not only rethinking the, the, the principles, uh, but adding new ones. Thank you. I suppose this is more a comment than a question, correct? Thank you. Uh, we do have to close, unfortunately. I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, tremendous convergence between them. I certainly go out of this panel as a privacy regulator with the challenge to ensure empowerment in a completely new context of risk and protection. Thank you all for participating. Merci beaucoup et uh, au revoir. Buenas tardes, buenas noches. Good evening. Muchísimas gracias entonces a los panelistas y moderadores que nos han acompañado en este último panel del día. La señora Chantal Bernier, Larry Maget, Clara Guerra, 
Pablo Pérez, San José y Steve Good. Les eh, comunico algo que en 15 minutos salen los ómnibus hacia Montevideo. Los que hayan venido por el día, los ómnibus que salen hacia Montevideo salen en 15 minutos. Gracias. En 15 minutos, buses, buses to Montevideo is already in the hall. Thanks.